The month of April is Autism Awareness Month, a neurodevelopment disorder that affects approximately 4% of the Kenyan population. Globally, 1 in 100 children is diagnosed with the spectrum disorder, and consequently, parents find themselves in the difficult position of trying to provide the best care and management to their children. So, in honor of this month, I am dedicating all the stories shared to parents and caregivers of autistic children. I hope that the stories I share this month not only give you hope, but ensure that you do not feel alone if you are walking this journey with your children. We kick things off with Edna's story. When her daughter was eight, she found out that she was pregnant again. So she and her husband buckled down to raise another baby. When their second daughter was about a year old, they took notice of a couple of things that just seemed a bit odd. Here's a bit of what's coming up. Autism also can find itself in a, in your lineage. If someone had is autistic, it can find yourself there. But we being Africans, autism is not something that we are used to. So I wouldn't know if anyone in my family is, aut- is autistic. And unfortunately, autism has been labeled. We don't label it autism, we label it witchcraft. That's witchcraft. Yeah. You did something wrong. Your grandfather and grandmother did something wrong. You as a parent did something wrong. You went to witch doctors. You gave out your child. Name it. We will delve into this story in a little bit. But before we do, this is Mama Tales, a podcast on our collective motherhood journey. I'm your host, Sally Kuria. If this is your first time listening, Karibu Sana. New episodes like this drop every single Tuesday. Well, other than the last two weeks where I was forced to take a break. You can find these episodes in major podcasting platforms, so make sure you subscribe. And on YouTube as well. Join the over 800 people who are subscribed to our bi-monthly newsletter. This is a space I use to share ideas beyond this podcast, and it is open to contributors and people who would want to share a message with the community. So if you have an idea or a thought on parenting that you'd like to share with us, do let me know by replying to any issue. You can find a link to the newsletter and how to subscribe in the show notes of this episode. Lastly, make sure you follow this podcast on our socials. That's at Mama Tales Podcast on Instagram and TikTok. I have been using these platforms to share some thoughts that seem to be very relatable to a lot of you. And if you want real-time parenting plus a whole lot of cooking and day-to-day stuff, check out my personal page on Instagram as well. That's at Sally Mugure. All of this will be in the show notes. So, first of all, thank you for having me. So, my name is Edna. This is Edna. She is a food content creator and a researcher and a mom of two amazing little girls, 11 and 3, with their three-year-old daughter being on the autistic spectrum. My journey began when I was uh, 24 years old. That's when I got my first child. I was blessed enough to have... Um, I had a smooth... My pregnancy was smooth. My delivery was smooth. And my journey now into motherhood... I think the fact that I had worked in a children's home prior, even while I was pregnant, that sort of prepared me for motherhood Mm -hmm. because we were taking care of children who are like a day old, uh, those that had been picked from, you know, hospitals, uh, places they had been dumped to, to teenagers. And then being a firstborn, in Africa, firstborns kind of raise the other children by default. You become assistant parents, whether you like it or not. So I had a a smooth sailing and I had uh, people around me who who are always there to help me with a child. So it wasn't a burden. The only thing I remember that I didn't like about motherhood was breastfeeding. I would go online, YouTube, and I say, oh, I've pumped how many millimeters in a day? Ooh, my breastfeeding journey. And I was like, what am I doing wrong? Why, why why am I the only one who is screaming help when it comes to breastfeeding? My breastfeeding journey was, ah, it wasn't good. And even with that, I think that traumatized me such that with my second child, I didn't really breastfeed. It was pumping all the way. I was like, nope, I'm not about to to do this again. So I pumped. Though later on, she, she started breastfeeding when we were about, um, I think, one and a half years old that's when she started she began breastfeeding yes so a breastfeeding year one and a half she was just like i don't know it wasn't really breastfeeding she was just comfort 
and that's when actually now the um autism started now kicking in the signs and symptoms of autism started kicking in because they do what we call a lot of um steaming which we'll get to and one way of her steaming was through breast breastfeeding she will really find comfort in that so with my second child i know it sounds weird but i don't know how it happened I did it it wasn't planned I didn't plan for it I I I wasn't looking for a child I was content with one but here I am pregnant and I found out I was pregnant like 2 months in I didn't know I just felt my stomach like my stomach was just hard for no apparent reason and I had this metallic taste in my mouth that just couldn't go away so by the time I was finding out I was pregnant I was like around 2 months She had a totally normal pregnancy and hoped that she would have a vaginal birth like she did with her firstborn. During delivery, everything went well, but she thought the baby took a little longer than usual to let out her first cry. I felt like my child took long to cry, but the the doctors were not concerned. They didn't see it as an issue. You know the way, let me give an example, the way you can send someone maybe to a shop and then you you have an estimated time of when that person should come back and then you're like mm, this person has taken long and then they show up mm. so you will not find it like um an issue yeah. so that's what happened to me so i was like when the baby was out i was like hey this child is not crying and then now they begin crying mm. but the doctors did not didn't find a cause of alarm yeah. like this child has taken long or anything so i also didn't bother I just asked is my child okay they're like yeah you know Amelia so the, your child is fine so no cause of alarm so fast forward we 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 are released of course we go home the baby is okay but the baby could not breastfeed for some strange reasons so we try I try now giving uh the doctors recommended that if they cannot breastfeed and you you know they check i don't know under the tongue just to check if they are tongue tied and all that my baby was fine so we didn't know what was causing the child not to breastfeed but the doctors recommended how about you pump and i was like ah oh, pumping is even better cuz remember i didn't have a good um experience with breastfeeding with my first child so i was like even the second child pumping was the way to go so i pump and whenever i pumped the child could somehow breastfeed yeah. yeah could bottle feed this struggles with breastfeeding were not new to edna but this time round it was all made worse by the fact that she hadn't grieved the death of her mother her mother died 2 weeks before she had delivered her second born having been told that those feelings would not do her baby any good she held it all in until her baby was born and she believes that this intense emotional state made an already difficult situation that much harder and it was so heavy I, i i i was depressed i would cry day in day out so because of that my milk production wasn't as high i opted to start uh nan using the nan feeding what are they called yeah, the formula. formula thank you i said i opted to use the formula but my daughter could not take any formula we tried all sorts of formula again a sign of autism but it must be checked by a doctor yeah. right so but th- those were like early signs because uh, autistic children tend to be hyper allergic mm. to everything mm. my daughter can't stomach milk till date any sort of milk whether we tried goat milk goat formula we tried i don't know bill and what cow cow and what mm. nan name it we even tried shipping in one from south africa that's how far we went but she could not stomach it we tried camel milk she could not stomach it goat milk she could not stomach it we tried soya milk that's the only thing she could take mm. soya milk and almond milk those ones but now i just had to find a way of now just pumping and breastfeeding As their daughter grew older, they started noticing odd things. Initially, they didn't think they were alarming signs and just chalked it off to their daughter's unique personality. She would stare into space and not stare at a person. She would prefer looking at spaces than looking at people's faces. 
which is awkward because children should prefer looking at faces. They need to seek people's faces because children don't like being alone. She'll just give you an awkward stare. But you can tell it's not you she's looking at. She's looking past you. Anytime we would feed, there was no that eye contact. She just didn't like human interaction. She she was cute cooing it's called cooing where well, yeah cooing the baby sound that should do but human interaction was not there even with children you know the way children will be drawn to other children and be excited nothing then when it came to crawling she crawled with one leg one leg up the other leg on a normal four which was awkward but then again we felt like hmm labda it's a style i mean who whoever told you that crawling is it ha- must happen on fours and then when she started walking when she started like lifting herself on things and walking she would tiptoe any time she was on her feet she would tiptoe and we would wonder why is this child tiptoeing so they noticed this odd things but didn't worry too much about them because everything else seemed to be okay she crawled at the right time she started walking a little bit later but in the expected range however When she got to one and a half, alarm bells started ringing. So what happened is by the time she was getting to around one and a half, she could not even say goodbye. You know, the way you you leave a child and like, hi, bye, bye. And they would copy that by, she would not. And then that's when I noticed, no, there must be something wrong. And the child just did not, in my words, did not love me. You know, the way a child sees the mother and just wants to wrap themselves around their mother my child didn't want that my child did not want to be carried by anyone she just doesn't want to be carried and of course people would look at it like hey you don't take your child out to meet people that's why you know they are rejecting being carried but later on i learned that touch gave her some sort of shock it's like you're electrifying her whenever you touched her there's just some wave of currency that she felt that she didn't want to be touched so whenever we took um, our child for immunization i'll bring these issues up like i'll tell the doctor my child is just not interested with me or in me or the things i do she would walk past me she just doesn't want that human interaction completely and the and the doctor would say okay she it's a bit too early to diagnose for anything let's give her time because she could be a late bloomer and will be okay you know the doctors have said the doctor has said so and again it's a repeatable institution so you're like okay kama ni amesema we are cool with it let's flow with it so we are getting to two years the child hasn't talked any word the child is still not saying the simple things like bye she's not pointing you know the simple things pointing showing interest in people she would only show interest in colors so she would come to you if you have something bright on and it has to be one a monochrome like if it's yellow it's yellow it not mixed mm. if it's red it's red not mixed she would be interested in you so you would think oh this baby wants me to carry her but no they're interested in the color of your shirt not you as a person and they will just you will carry them and they will not look at you in the eye they will go straight to the shirt or the bangle or whatever it is that you're putting on not to you so later on we started now persisting with the doctors that know there's something wrong with this child so now the now the doctors advised us to take the child to and it's called an ECD the uh, early childhood development center it's one in Kenya and <laughs> get roots mudaiga they have an early childhood development center so basically what happens you go there you take your child for total assessment so they look at the child and then if there's anything they'll diagnose the child if there's nothing they'll just say okay maybe your child is just a late bloomer we are not able to trace anything and they will give you a way forward of course before they went to get through they went to Kenyatta Hospital Doctors Plaza to get a consultation from a pediatric neurologist they asked a lot of questions so how was your delivery which i was shocked because i mean i thought hey the issue is the child not me yeah. 
they asked how was the delivery how was your pregnancy what kind of emotions did you go through while you're pregnant were you stressed did you have any issue during pregnancy any tiny issue that needed you know the doctors um uh concern and all that and now as they were asking that and I'm answering is when then they're just writing notes of course they don't tell you anything and then she, he was like okay I'm not the best doctor for your child take them to Mudaiga and unfortunately now autism is 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 an issue with the development that affects social how you you know recognize things basically how your brain processes things it's not a disease yeah. So there's no emergency around it. It's not like your child has a fever you'll be rushed into an emergency. So we go to Mudaiga and they tell us, "Oh, you've come to the ECD, your karibuni sana, but you have to book." So we go around I think it was like the month of May. We are booked in for around August. It's not an emergency. It's the only center what do you expect oh there are a million and one children waiting for their turn yeah. and you pay an arm and a leg and i'm thinking for me i can afford or not yet afford but we had done some research and because we were given that threshold of we waited for uh, around three months and this during these three months there's literally nothing they can do they tell you just take your child home and wait for those three months and you'll come literally nothing so here i am a mother i'm busy panicking because this doctor does not see the agency i have this doctor does not see the the need in me the cry that i'm having towards my daughter me i'm thinking this child is two and they're not showing any sign you need to treat them now so that they start showing signs tomorrow and they just you know like sikupuza but to me it was like kupuza because to me it was an emergency but they're like but your child is not sick we have a line and the next appointment is 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 for three months to come yeah. there's literally nothing you can do during that time apart from research and even if you research what are you researching about yeah, cause, exactly because there's no diagnosis you don't know, you don't know. Yeah and and Google can be a shocker. You say my child cannot walk. Oh, it brings a whole list of things <laughs> why your child cannot walk and you cannot pinpoint oh it must be this. So we are patient we wait and we were booked in and we went in so for consultation at that time I paid it was 4500. That's just consultation. The way you just enter and you talk to a doctor and you say oh my head my arm my 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 eye my what and then they're like okay let's do this test this bado jalipia test <laughs> that's just consultation oh and the consultation is almost like if you don't know you will be very shocked because what they do they just put the child there to play and observe me i was thinking of i don't know press her pinch her something you know remove her clothes do something uh, you know put thermometers i don't know but what they just did is gave her toys and they were observing and as they were observing they are asking me questions how does she play and i realized when my daughter plays in specific ways she will take spoons and line them up she will take bottles and line them up in a straight line perfectly straight line she will take um items and just line them up and they have to be items of the same theme mm. so she will not take a spoon and a bottle top and a bottle no if it's spoons spoons and a fork will not be there if it's forks forks if it's specific things if you if if we bought, we bought her toys both dolls and cars she refused dolls completely no teddy bears no dolls it's only recently that she's been able to accept them slowly but with the cars she would only play with the wheels with bikes whenever she saw children riding their bikes she would like want the bike and if you gave her she would lay the back bike down and just spin the wheels spin the wheels and she would spend hours and hours there just spinning wheels spinning wheels spinning wheels and that would fascinate her you look at her face and you, you see she's having the time of her life just spinning and spinning and spinning 
And whenever she would spin herself round, she would not get dizzy. She would do it for hours, just spinning, spinning, spinning. And you're like, okay. When you get a hold of her, she's not dizzy. She's okay. And then she was always on the go. Mm. She did not walk. She ran. Mm. And she ran tiptoeing. And she would run for on and on. Run to the sitting room, the kitchen, and back. Back. It was like a marathon. Mm. Throughout. Until you hold her. And then she would not sit down. Normal, a normal child should be able to sit. Yeah. Even if it's for five minutes, ten minutes. Sit. Even if they're just doing nothing, just sit on a chair. My child could never sit on a chair. Mm-hmm. Until a few months ago is when she could sit. After sessions and sessions of therapy is when she could sit down. So my child will never sit. So even eating was standing. Wow. So those are some of the things that we noted. Like, ah. And when the doctors were asking, okay, so how do you feed her? And, she, and we're like, oh, we're still feeding her. She's not able to feed herself because she cannot connect this plate, spoon, and the mouth. But for finger foods, she would eat. Mm-hmm. But the spoon, not yet. And then when it comes, comes to potty training, which is a huge thing when, when, it come, when it comes to autism, she can't feel. So she doesn't know when she's urinating or pooping. She can't feel it. So she doesn't get the urge. She just poops. So even now she's three years old and she's still in diapers. Yeah. You can't do without diapers because she cannot feel. Of course, there are times we let her just be without diapers, but she doesn't have that feeling. And then she's non-verbal. So funny thing is that she speaks, but speaks, I call it intellectually, but she does not communicate, which is funny because... Um, if you showed her color, she'll tell you what color that is. She'll say, when she comes into the room, a room like this, this might be a bit too much for her, but a room like this, she'll be able to identify things. She'll say pink, purple, blue. That's how she talks. So what her brain is doing is just um, absorbing information. Yeah. That's all her brain does. So we go somewhere, she will, she will identify numbers she can read she'll identify numbers she'll identify letters she can count one up to 10 and backwards she can she uh, that's how her brain processes things but she will not communicate she will not come and say mom i want mom i need mom look mom but she will come and say oh tree oh yellow oh red one two three and if it's not complete she will complete it Mm. like if number one two three were written somewhere She'll say one, two, three, and complete it to ten, even if she's not seeing up to ten. She can't do it halfway. When it came to food, she can only eat dry foods. So nothing wet. No soup. No soup. If it's ugali, ugali. Tupambane na ugali kwanza. If it's rice, rice. So even when I put soup, it can't be watery because she'll not take it. But through therapy, we've been able to achieve a few milestones, which I'll talk about. So, when it came to playing, she will just play on her own. Even if you put her in the middle of a hundred children, she will find somehow find her own spot. Nothing about children fascinates her. Not unless they are putting on maybe a bright shirt yeah. or a, a, a top with something she can identify, a letter that she can read and all that. She'll come and not come to the child to... Uh, you know, play and all that, but just touch whatever it is and then just move on. Mm -hmm. Nothing about a child fascinates her. She doesn't play with other children. She just literally isolates herself, not playing alone while with children, but literally you'll see her in a different corner. If children run towards her, she'll go the other direction. Mm -hmm. Uh, Yeah, and uh, she doesn't talk. Like I mentioned, she's non-verbal. She doesn't talk. She will find other ways of expressing herself. If she wanted something, she will take you to it. Mm-hmm. If she needed maybe water and you're in the sitting room, she'll drag you to the kitchen and make you, you know, stand where the water is. So it's up to you now to keep guessing. Oh, you want water? You want something? Are you hungry? Things like that. So we've learned to put things at her level so she's just able to find her way through and be able to, you know, get whatever it is that she needs. 
those are the questions that were being asked how does she play how does she relate with you how does she relate with other relatives what happened to you while you are giving birth because all those things come to play though unfortunately they cannot pinpoint that aha uh-huh, it is because of this reason that your daughter is autistic yeah. they can't unfortunately they can't pinpoint that but because you've brought up all these issues they will say okay these are all possible reasons that will help them know what kind of therapy to give mm-hmm. that is just a di- more of a direction to them because autism also can find itself in a, in your lineage if someone had is autistic it can find yourself there but we being africans autism is not something that we are used to so i wouldn't know if anyone in my family is aut- is autistic mm-hmm. now from my daughter going for then her generations to come they will know they will know because we have identified it but my, my me and my husband can't tell uh, how, how are we even supposed to tell if someone didn't talk until they were five years how does that concern us those are not things we go about talking but grandmothers maybe they would see something in a child and they'll be able to tell you okay i've seen this street it's happening and unfortunately autism has been labeled we don't label it autism we label it witchcraft that's witchcraft yeah you did something wrong your grandfather and grandmother did something wrong you as a parent did something wrong you went to which doctors you gave out your child name it other than looking for maybe something medically to, okay there's something clearly wrong with this child what can we do and what is this so we didn't know that and then now the other things that your child goes through they look at the ear because if this child is not talking could could it be they're not hearing so they look at the they check the ears they they check uh, that will be done through they do like speech therapy depending on the level your child is in all that they check they run a, it's a, it's a blood count but it's not this kawaida blood count to check at is g or red blood cells and white blood cells they check what other thing could be i think they check the dna because the results of that blood comes out like after a week or so so there are other things they check yeah. and you pay you pay one like maybe the hearing we paid like 3500 the blood you'll pay like 7000 you know and in total you you spend almost 30000 that is just diagnosis atujanza matibabu atujanza therapy so after that is when we were told okay so your daughter is autistic We will put a pause here and in the next episode we will get into how Edna and her family adjusted their lives around their daughter's condition. She talks about the struggles of finding a school, navigating a full-time job with her daughter's care, the cost implication of this diagnosis and the community she has built to support them. Here's a bit of what's coming up next week. So they told us we, she needs to go to school. So well, in my head I'm like, ah, shule tu. See, I just choose the one I want. Yeah. Which one? Picky, picky, ponky. <laughs> this one will come to you, and then we go. So we do that. The first school. Uh huh. Yeah, we are here. We're bringing our child. What school fees? Ningapi? And they're like, even before that school fees, bring that child first. Let's have a look. And they look at the child, and they're like, no, we're not taking her. And you go to the next school. Eh. Uh. Oh, she's what autistic okay how old she's yet to turn three. oh so like two and a half mm, later and we take the child they observe the child and we're like no we're not taking her i have never felt rejected in my life let me tell you i mourned a child who was alive Thanks for listening. Remember to share this with a friend or two. If you're listening to this episode on Spotify Mobile, let me know what you think about it and anything else you'd love to hear on this podcast. If you have a story to share, it's super super easy. Fill in the storyteller submission form in the show notes of this episode for consideration. Remember, your story is powerful. Catch you in the next one. Bye.